Hey everyone, so One Piece Chapter 1025 just came out and we have a lot to talk about, mainly Yamato. So, for a long time, I've had issues with Yamato as a character, and I still do, a lot, but this chapter at least helped. This was the first chapter, I think, in a long time that I felt like, okay, Yamato as more than just a one-dimensional, I love Odin, <laughs> put it on my shirt type character, has kind of like begun to emerge okay so to start with in terms of strength Yamato it seems like uh, doing about as well against Kaido as Luffy was back when Luffy picked up on advanced conquerors hockey so that's obviously very impressive because uh, the Thunder Bagua clash that they had last chapter from what it looked like it looked like Kaido was bleeding a little bit maybe that's just the scans that I was reading but it looked like Kaido was bleeding just like a little bit which is, of course, <laughs> pretty insane. Uh, not too many people in the world can make Kaido bleed. And then on top of that, well, I guess flashback to all nine scabbards doing it, but we won't talk about that. But <laughs> not in a clash like that, right? So Kaido bleeding a little bit, that's pretty impressive. Now, what Yamato did, I'm not fully familiar with, you know, the Kirin lore. So I'm not 100% sure what the full extent of their abilities are. I did not realize that they can just sort of shed an outer shell and jump out of it like that. So the fact that Yamato has, I like seeing that a lot because it reminds you essentially that mythical zones offer you abilities that are more than just a normal zone. Because with normal zones, the advantage that comes with them obviously is, you know, just the physical, the increased physical prowess, right? Durability, strength, speed, etc. But too often it can feel like, well, with a mythical zone, what more, I think, especially with Yamato's fruit, right? It started to feel a little bit like, well, with the mythical zone, what more are you really getting out of it? And we get glimpses out of it with other mythical zones, obviously with Orochis, at least at first to me, Orochis just seemed like an eight headed monster without, you know, any sort of mystical properties. But now just the fact that Orochi seems to be able to survive death over and over again. Okay. That sort of makes sense for what his fruit's got going for him. Kaido, obviously the dragon fruit, it's more than just brute strength. He's got fire, lightning, wind, basically most, most of the elements he's just got down, the flame clouds that can carry islands around. So I like seeing that, okay, we're getting some glimpses of what Yamato's mythical zone is able to do. But more importantly than that, okay, so obviously Kaido starts to get angry and begins to overpower her, but through that we begin to realize more of a full picture of kind of where Yamato is coming from as a character. So. I've definitely been annoyed with Yamato saying over and over again, I want to be Odin, I want to be Odin, and that's just such a really, really weak, kind of crudely written motive, written in motivation, and it kind of flies because it's the One Piece world, but whatever. But at least we can start to understand a little bit, okay, the full scope of it, which is, so one, it's the blood in Yamato's veins that she's trying to get rid of or get away from and we've understood that before right that that's not completely new but the main reason is largely because i suppose it seems to be relating to friendship and being able to bond with people that she actually wants to be able to bond with so in that sense humans she doesn't want to be the only princess she doesn't want to be tied down to kaido's blood she wants to be able to to be part of or, or be with other people right to be a part of what <laughs> the rest of society is like right so that's what she really really yearns for to be with other people and to be, you know, <laughs> not chained down to just being the son of Kaido, to be chained down to being a monster, right? So that is a much more interesting motivation, at least that's beginning to emerge from there. And just some of the lines that we're getting out of that. So you can't get away from your blood. That's not Kaido's exact quote or whatever, but you have the blood of me running in your veins. No one will ever, he's essentially gaslighting her here, basically <laughs> saying no one will ever uh, except you, they'll always fear you, you're the only princess, etc. And, you know, part of it, a little bit, is probably true. There are going to be many, many people we've observed in the One Piece world. Not everyone is that tolerant, so there's going to be many, many people who do fear her, right? But the fact is that she has been able to make friends, flashback to Ace, flashback to the Samurai, etc. Uh, it's just that her friends seem to get punished anytime anybody ever tries to help her. So, I think that at the very least, we, we need one more sort of piece to come together, I, su I suppose, for her, which is we can kind of already imagine the, you know, the jump from uh, her being lonely child who does not like being the son of Kaido, son, daughter, whatever of Kaido, right? 
who does suffer for her inability to be able to connect with other people and make friends because of who her father is, right? And then seeing someone that is universally loved by the people of Wano, Odin, right? And kind of understanding that this is who I want to be. I want to be that type of person. And I don't know if it's the love that she's interested in, that the fact that everybody in Wano seemed to be drawn to Odin and actually really liked Odin, or just the fact that Odin seemed like a very inspirational figure and therefore that is who she would rather follow in the footsteps of, or of rather than her father. But now it makes a little more sense why A led to B and why then she got that stuck in her head for so long. So I like that. I want to see more exploration or more kind of a concrete connection between that and that, like these two parts of her character that one, she really, really wants to be Odin. And two, this is what she suffered from throughout her childhood. Maybe Oda doesn't, feel, Oda doesn't feel the need to give her that, so we'll see. But I do feel like Oda has just in the last two chapters just started opening up the character exploration of Yamato, finally. So I would expect, I think, a little bit more out of Yamato before all of this is said and done. So I like the fact that we're moving in that direction. Now, Yamato aside, we just found out that the Onis are a confirmed race in One Piece. And, you know, that's not something crazy that we couldn't have figured out before. It did seem fairly apparent that there are a lot of people walking around with horns throughout the series. Like, why does Gekko Moria have this? Why does uh, Kaido have this? Even giant versions of them like Ors or Ors Jr. Are they Onis or are they a, just a offshoot of the, the Oni version of giants or something like that? Maybe that's a thing. Maybe Oni versions of giants are a thing. But it's interesting to basically see that something that we could have all kind of guessed at for a long time, but we did just need that in-story confirmation that yes, this is a thing that Onis exist, and this is a separate race from humans, makes sense with the Kaido world's strongest creature, not man title. Obviously, Oda's not going to call him a man because he's not actually a man, and he doesn't want to drop like world's strongest Oni because it's like, how many Oni are there in the world? Like, <laughs> probably like, we've seen like six. So... You know, and probably doesn't want to name drop that race so early, so Kaido gets world's strongest creature. And it goes to the idea that he's just a monster, right? He's not he's not a human like the rest of us. He's just this monster, this beast that lives on this freakish Oni island, and he we just don't call him a man, right? So the Oni race being a thing, it does go back to me for for me it does go back to Big Mom's discussion of the three races that she's missing from her crew. So as far as I know, one is the Giants, right? Two is Lunarians, three is the Oni race. Did we just solve that? Is that it? Unless she's deliberately not even counting the Giants because she just hates them so much, in which case there's a third missing race, but I don't think that's the case. So yeah, I think we just solved it, right? So Lunarians, Onis, Giants. With this chapter, that's pretty much, yeah, cover to cover, that's pretty much covered it. So. This is actually putting together a lot of mysteries, I think, just from this one chapter. So Yamato one, that's kind of figured out to a degree. Big Mom, what she's looking for, that's kind of figured out to a degree. Now, the other <laughs> the other side of things, so Luffy and Momo. I think we did get a bit of a glimpse because one of the big questions was, is Momonosuke going to have the heart of a... People phrased it weirdly, but you get what I'm saying here when people are saying like, is Momonosuke going to be a little kid in a giant adult's body or is he going to be, you know, adult Momo in adult Momo's body? I don't know for sure if we can answer that right here. It did feel to me like Momonosuke is still the same old Momonosuke, just a lot bigger at this point, which I prefer because that doesn't, that means that you can't just skip character development or character growth for the for him. He just is more capable now of being able to execute what he wished he could do when he was a child, but he still has to find the mental fortitude and, uh, yeah, and will to be able to execute it, right? So it checks off one of the problems that he was going through, but he still has to do it as a character himself, right? He has to take that step forward as a character himself. But at the same time, I can't say that 100% for sure, why? Because it's possible that adult Momonosuke, even if he was aged up 20 years mentally as well, it's completely possible that adult Momonosuke just, well, he just naturally has this fear of heights anyway. So maybe we get him turning back and turning into an adult next chapter and it's just the exact same thing where he's, uh, uh, you know, he's fully mature, wise, smart, intelligent in every other aspect, but he's still just scared of heights. So I don't know, but at least going off of this chapter, uh, my guess is, sure, he's 
he's still just the same old Momonosuke, but just a lot bigger now. Uh, I thought the interactions between Luffy and Momonosuke were fun, you know, funny. I thought that the point of having Momonosuke go through the entire dome was obvious, which is to show the entire alliance that Luffy is back. There's literally no other reason to do it otherwise, because, you know, the, the, the point of showing that Luffy is back, that is a huge, huge, huge deal, right? That's what historically throughout One Piece kind of that, that happens basically like you can go back to <laughs> you can go back to uh, versus Kuro versus the Arlong Pirates versus Baroque Works versus NL, right? Like the moment when Luffy comes back is usually when uh, things sort of be like things are usually at their lowest point. Luffy comes back and then that's basically reigniting the spark of hope, etc, cetera, etc cetera, for everybody. Here it's a little different, and I can expand on that in other in some future video, I guess, basically, on uh, my thoughts about the direction that this seems headed. But Luffy came back at a very, I don't know, uh, it was a much more comical way and a much less needed return, if that makes sense, at least for the space that the main characters were in, if you go back through the past couple chapters. Because things are going pretty good. Things are going pretty good, all things concerned. Things are going pretty easy breezy for everybody in the, uh, everybody who's currently in a fight, they're all kind of winning. And everybody who's just finished up their fights, you know, they're all just uh, making their way down to the live floor. So, I don't know, I, I think that the, I'll just say, I think that the way at the time that Luffy returned is very, very interesting. And anyway, Luffy and Momonosuke are back at the, at the rooftop now. One thing that, okay, so maybe I'm just, Stupid, but I didn't realize this. Okay, I've been calling Momonosuke a red dragon for a long, long time. I've been calling him a red dragon for a very, very long time. And other people I've seen have called him a pink dragon. Stuff. Yeah, pink dragon, any other colors? No, but that's, that's just how I've been calling him, red dragon. Turns out this chapter, he's supposed to be a peach dragon. Okay, and that makes a lot of sense with the story of Momotaro and, you know, the peach, etc., etc. So, Am I color? I that's not the color of peach to me, but it does make sense for that's what Oda's going for essentially, right? That you know, Momo he's a peach colored dragon because that just makes sense with the inspiration that he's going off of. And speaking of which, the story of Momotaro, the, the assembly that we've got up there, right? It is is Marco gonna get up there because the assembly that we've got up there it is Momo with a dog by his side with a monkey by his side. I, are we, is Marco going to be part of this final fight? I mean, final fight. Is Marco going to be fight, part of this fight to take down Kaido? Like, I, I don't get it because it feels like Oda really, really is trying to set up very, very distinctly that same trio. You get Momotaro, you get a monkey, you get a dog, and you're up against an Oni. So it just seems, if Oda's trying to get that close to it, then like, is, is he going to get Marco up there as well? I don't know. It just feels a little... Because Marco's kind of tapped out, and Marco, out of the three of them, is way, 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 way more detached from the rest of this battle, right? So he's actually by far the most, most, uh, most of most of what you would call a tag along, I guess, essentially throughout this entire conflict, right? He really, really came into the game late, and it is mostly just to help out Luffy, give a helping hand, right? He has very little personal investment, I guess, in the events of Wano and everything like that. Odin died a long time ago, and that was the only real connection he had to the country. I mean, Inurashi Nekomamushi, I suppose, as well. But, I don't know. It, it just seems odd to me that, like, Oda is not dropping in that third piece of the tale. So maybe Oda is just satisfied with having it be just, you know, two-thirds of the trio. The dog, you got the dog and the monkey. But I don't know the way Oda thinks. Maybe Marco is making his way up there for like a surprise appearance, or maybe there's some other character that actually represents the pheasant that we're not thinking of at the moment that is in the fray that will play a big role in this, at least in this encounter. Um, but it does seem at the very least like Oda has set up, you know, the, the big climax to this act being these three versus Kaido. I don't know how much of a role Momonosuke himself will be playing here because for one, Luffy and Yamato are both really, really strong right now. They're both really, really strong right now. Like, they both it seem like leveled up to a degree over their last encounters with Kaido, right? They're both really, really strong right now. They can both individually give Kaido a run for their money, and they're both together. 
Also, Luffy used Snake Man, used Gear Fourth for an instant, right? We've seen him do this. This is like we've seen him do this again, like against the number with Bound Man, and that was and even with Law and Kid back before they got to Onigashima, where he used Gear Fourth briefly. But just right now, to me, it's still just shocking to see that Luffy can freely swap between Gear Fourth forms. He clearly does still have does still have the hockey drawback but it seems that that's just the case if he uses it for an extended period of time at this point right so we saw in the battle of onigashi or the battle on the rooftop that if luffy used gear fourth for too long against kaido then he did have to take a breather and zoro had to kind of shield him for a little bit but you know if you go back just to whole cake island luffy switched to gear fourth to get a hit in against big mom briefly while they're while they're escaping the rooftop over there you had two rooftops i forgot about that so while they're escaping the rooftop over there, what? what's, what's up with Oda and rooftops right now? Anyway, while they were escaping the rooftop over there, Luffy used Gear 4 briefly and was immediately drained. He couldn't fight for like, you know, a brief period of time, Sanji had to carry him around and stuff. But here he's just switching into Gear 4 casually to land a hit in against Kaido. And we don't even see him turning back. We just get the panel pan like cutting over to him and he's already back in normal form. So Luffy's on another one right now. So is Yamato. Momonosuke is the odd man out. I don't know how much of help he'll be. I think we all do like the idea, for the most part, of Momonosuke's big contribution being carrying Onigashima, right, for at least for a moment. Just uh, replicating that feat of Odin, kind of getting the people of Wano behind him and to see a new sort of, uh, a new sort of champion for the nation. What they ascribe to Odin, they can now ascribe to Momonosuke in a sense, kind of carrying on that will, yada yada. But um, I do think that we are going to get at least a, some contribution from Momonosuke against Kaido because it just feels like Kaido himself has to gain some, some degree of respect for Momonosuke. If you go back to Momo's childhood encounter with Kaido, how Kaido treated Momonosuke when Momonosuke was up on the execution stand recently, I think that Momonosuke does need to earn Kaido's respect in some sort of way, aside from just turning into a big dragon. Also interesting to me that Oda had Kaido turn back from his hybrid form to his worst form, which is his dragon form. Historically, throughout this arc, his dragon form has been the worst performer so far against any opponent. It feels like anyone can beat up Kaido's dragon form. It, that thing gets wasted, like, it just gets beat up all the time. But Kaido turned back so that Oda could draw the panel of Dragon Kaido facing Dragon Momo even though it makes no sense for Kaido to do right now. I guess he, maybe even Kaido wanted to do that little... <laughs> he was just like, well, I'm a dragon. And he's like, let me show you. You're a dragon. All right, so maybe Kaido just wanted to flex that he's also a dragon. So it's not like it makes no sense. It's just funny to me that in the midst of this battle where Kaido's finally against two people who can actually give him trouble, right? This is probably the most stacked little uh, pairing of opponents that he's faced so far considering, you know, back when he was fighting all the supernovas, he also had Big Mom on his side, and everybody was kind of just figuring out their techniques. Luffy didn't have advanced conquerors hockey or anything like that. But now he's up against Luffy, who was giving him a decent challenge, right, when they were going 1v1, and against Yamato, who was just giving him a decent challenge 1v1, and this surprise X factor of another dragon in Momonosuke. So now Kaido's actually up against some serious opposition, and he chooses this moment to turn all the way back into his worst form so that we get this little imagery of, you know, peach dragon, blue dragon. But I like it. I like seeing it colored. And I wonder how long we'll see Kaido in dragon form next chapter. I like to think he'll go back to hybrid form to just go take on Luffy and Yamato at the same time. And, you know, we'll see from there. But that's all for this chapter. I thought it was a really, really packed chapter. And I will talk to you all next week.